use the mic? Do you, do you want to use the mic? Uh, hmm. I think uh, you can start with it first. Yeah. So uh, I'll just I'll just use it and then if you the uh, slides, do I connect it here? Uh, yeah, after we say that your intro, okay. then we'll just move it over. Cool. And then I think it was... Okay. Mic test. Hi guys. Thank you guys for coming down today to the first Friday Hacks of the semester. So today we're starting off with a talk by Eugene Gin. Uh, it's called Security as Code, Building Our Way to Better Security Outcomes. So let's give a round of applause for him. Oh yeah, you need to change it to the I just other. bring it over here. Unplug. Yeah. Does it do anything? Test, test. So this one goes to yeah. Oh, so it's not just being yet. Yeah. Okay, wait, it's coming out, it's coming out. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Can take that out. Okay. It reads as a new like display. Oh, you can just go this. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Yeah. So I'm Eugene, I'm a lead security engineer at Open Government Products. So you may have heard of it, it's uh, kind of a branch in government where we uh, build stuff. Uh, we build form SG, a uh, bunch of other things, you may have seen it in news headlines, good or bad, you know, uh, but hopefully you've heard of us. And I think one of the things that has come up recently in the cybersecurity space uh, is the idea of how do you build for security, right? Because I think when you think of cybersecurity, a lot of us think of hackers, we think of people in, you know, uh, hoodies, uh, in the basements, you know, getting ransomware, and, and you know, either that or you're on the other side of things where you're fighting bad guys all the time, right? And 90% of your life is spent staying up at 3 a.m. because that's when they kind of drop the zero day on you. And you know, that's part of cybersecurity. That's one of the roles that you can do in cybersecurity. But another thing about cybersecurity is, of course, um, how do you then, the day after, what do you do, right? Do you just pick up the pieces? or do you build yourself stronger? And really that is kind of what gives you a lot of satisfaction in this space. Um, some of us may enjoy taking over sand castles all the time. I, I do, I like taking sand castles over. But then when you kick over sand castles, you also kind of have to think about the other side of things, right? How do I build a stronger sand castle? And I'm gonna kind of go into that about how we do it in open government products, and also kind of talk about you know uh, ideas that you may have, right? Because you may be thinking about your future as a security engineer, or you may be thinking of your future as a software engineer, right? And can you kind of do both? And that's kind of my idea for the talk today, and hopefully you come off with some ideas about that. So what I used to do, so some of you actually in the audience have kind of met me in my previous role. Um, I was in the cybersecurity group, and what I used to do was just hack, right? So I would do pen testing of government systems. I would find bugs. Uh, I would see things that I wish I didn't see, um, that I could forget, because I don't think our government system should be that bad, but they are, sometimes. Don't quote me on that, but this is recorded. The second thing is also hack, right? So other than just hacking government systems, I would hack the software that the government uses. So our government may use some enterprise software that we use every day, super important to operations, and my job was to take a look at it, open it up, and figure out if it was safe to use. 
right? Because if we're going to rely on this for the safety of our country, our people in this nation, um, then we got to make sure it's safe. And most of the times it isn't, right? And so that was fun as well, finding vulnerabilities in there. And the third thing I did was again, hacking, right? I would do red teaming, another part of offensive security. So what I would do is that I'll be tasked with breaking into a specific government agency or a specific ag uh, team in the agency, right? And I would work with friends and colleagues who would either do social engineering or we would drop phishing lures or we could, uh, uh, we would also kind of find vulnerabilities in the external attack surface. So until you just entered, he's one of the interns later. Uh, I'm gonna arrow him to talk to you guys if any of his experience at his internship at OGP. Um, but yeah, so you know, I, I think one of the things that I used to do in my previous role was just hack, right? And I loved it. I love breaking into things. I love analyzing things. Um, and recently, I made a change in my job, right? And now I work in security engineering, and it's a really different uh, role that I do every day. The first thing is, of course, I observe problems in uh, government in OGP, right? And I'm wondering, you know, why do they keep making this same mistake? Why do they keep being just vulnerable to a certain issue? The second is then I build, right? I think of a solution and I try to build it. And you know, what should I build? This is kind of part of the problem here because in OGP there's a lot of um, self-starting. You kind of have to decide, right? No one's gonna tell you what to do. You figure out what you want to do and you build it for yourself. So you think, okay, should I build a code linting rule? Or should I, you know, just do a scan for everyone? Should I do a external scan? Should I use a secure library, right? What's the best way to solve this problem to stop the number of repeat vulnerabilities across uh, government or in OGP? And the third thing, unfortunately, is I have to sell, right? Because in security, I think um, you may have dealt with this, uh, whether in your internships or uh, you're doing various jobs, right? Compliance is a thing, right? And compliance is one of those easy things um, that's easy for the person making everyone comply. But it's really hard for everyone who has to comply, right? And uh, we don't do that at OGP, right? We don't mandate things. Um, so there's a lot of selling involved, right? I have to go to a developer and be like, hey, this, uh, like, you know, uh, would you like to try this little widget I made that yeah, will supposedly make you more secure, right? And these guys are smart, right? Developers, you guys are software engineers, are smart. They're going to be like, why should I give you access to my system? Why should I install this? What is the real benefit um, to me using this little widget that you built, right? And when you think about it, that's actually a good thing, right? Because too often cybersecurity tools have been built and used that are slow, that are dangerous, that are costly, right? We know about the CrowdStrike incident, right? CrowdStrike, one of the best EDRs in the world, but also built in a way that, you know, the, if you read the after action review or the, uh, the root cause analysis, they literally just didn't do a broad integration test and wrote out a patch and it broke the entire world, right? Billions of dollars lost in one day. Right. And so we have a responsibility as security engineers to build securely, but also build well. Right. Uh, and if you kind of have used security tools before, if you have worked in blue teaming uh, systems, if you look at, you know, uh, I won't mention vendors, I don't know if you'll try to sue me or not, um, but um, the tools kind of suck. Right. They're slow, you know, they're expensive, and they don't actually do what they promise that they do, right? because people are still getting hacked every day. And these are huge companies, these are Fortune 500 companies that spend billions of dollars in security. So why, right? And, and this is one of the, I think, the bigger challenges in software engineering today, right? How do we continue to build fast, but safe, right? And that's an interesting problem. So why? Why did I, you know, enjoy my life hacking and, and find vulnerabilities and CVs stacking up, you know? You can't eat CVs, but it's still nice to put uh, somewhere, right? Um, why did I choose to then think about doing cybersecurity? And this is kind of the journey I had as a hacker uh, in this space. I wanted to solve real problems, right? And so maybe like about five years ago, I think I found one of my first big bugs where I found a SQL injection in a Starbucks financial database, right? So this was exposed to the internet and through this SQL injection, I was able to access all of their financial records that were stored in this enterprise database. Really bad stuff, right? Um, and you know, they paid me like $4,000 for it, nice, right? But you know, it's nice that people write about you. And it's uh, cool, right? It is really fun to have. Um, and I hope that you guys all try offensive security, try pen testing. I think it's one of the great ways to enter the industry. But then, you know, 
I found it at Starbucks, and I was like, oh, you know, their security looks kind of weak. I'm just going to keep hitting them and keep hitting them, right? And I was able to climb up the leaderboard, right? So this is kind of the, uh, I think, the hacker leaderboard uh, for Starbucks. And I was able to hit like, you know, second or third uh, in a few months, right? Um, but the thing is that there's always going to be other people hacking and finding other things as well, right? And no matter how hard I try, you know, um, you're never going to stay on top in terms of hacking because everyone has a different way of approaching a problem, right? And I, the way I like to think about hacking is kind of like, um, it's kind of like social engineering, but with code, um, where you try to figure out how someone built it, and then you try to figure out your way to break it, right? And there's always going to be someone with a different perspective. Uh, I've met so many great hackers in the community in the past few years, and they really do just see things differently. You have your own unique point of view, but you, they are also going to have your own unique point of view. And the thing about Pantastic is really subjective, right? You could wake up one day, you're feeling inspired, and you just hack. And the one thing that top hackers in the world will tell you is that there's a huge element of luck in it, right? Um, no matter how many checklists you do, there's this kind of inspiration. It's a creative um, task, right? And so that was one of the things I thought about, right? Like, hey, you know, sure, it's my hobby. I love doing it. But am I really, like, building something that lasts? And then one thing that came up to me, you know, I think this was last year, right, where Starbucks Singapore got hacked, right, and 330,000 Singaporeans' data got leaked. And I'm not sure if you guys were leaked, right, but mine was, right. And that got me thinking because I've been hacking on Starbucks for so many years, you know, I've been finding vulnerabilities, over vulnerabilities, and I've been feeling good about myself saying, hey, I helped secure uh, all these users in Starbucks because I prevented this SQL injection, right, and I caught this one injection. I call this cross-site scripting. I call this remote code execution, even, right? But, you know, it just takes one guy to find something you haven't found yet, right? And it's still lying out there somewhere. And it gets really bad, and it hurts people, right? And, and people are affected. And it got me thinking, you know, okay, so I'm going to spend the rest of my life, if I'm going to spend the rest of my life finding vulnerabilities, but I know that there's always going to be something else out there. And that something else, you know, no matter how hard I hack, it's going to be out there then what is the impact am I really leaving in this world, right? What do you really want to do? And one of the, I think, good experiences I have in, um, as a hacker, right, is that I get to see a lot of organizations. So I've hacked, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure about the number, but like more than 300 for sure, right? I made more than 1,000 voluntary reports uh, in HackerOne, right, to all kinds of vulnerabilities. I've hacked um, uh, government, uh, websites I've hacked, uh, big tech, I've hacked startups, right? And I've seen the whole range of how uh, organizations respond to vulnerability reports. So this is a really fun one. So I did find a vulnerability, and then, you know, uh, they had an email, uh, and I emailed them, and they said, okay, uh, let's give, give me a seven days to get back to you. And they got back to me with a literal, like, uh, I think it was a cease and desist letter, right, where I'm being accused of being a cat, uh, criminal in, in Canada or something. So I've uh, censored the uh, company name, but uh, basically just don't use their products. Oh wait, I didn't, oh, sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, right, and, and you, you see a vast range of ways that people respond to bumpy reports, right? And you know, I, I'm sure this is maybe top of your mind if you're on Reddit, you know, you probably have seen some, something about how people handle bumpy reports, right? It's really important. Um, and it's not just the immediate part where they respond quickly and they patch it, right? But it's whether they welcome it, right? Do they see a boundary report as a opportunity to solve a problem? Do they see it as a problem? Do they see it as something that they need to blame someone else for, right? Um, and so this is one of the biggest differentiating factors I've seen as a hacker, you know, white hat hacker, right? The companies that do the best in security are the ones that really do just take it seriously, right? They see it as like, oh, yo, yeah, that's a problem, right? And they, they fix it in an hour, right? And that's pretty, that's, pretty, that's pretty crazy, but that's possible. Um, and there are also companies out there that will look at yours and be like, all right, let's do the shit out of this guy. You know, like, oh, is he finding a boundary for us, right? And you're doing them a favor, to be honest, right? You're disclosing something to them. Um, and this is one of the key things that I observed when I was thinking about boundaries and thinking about why people get hacked. The second thing is solving problems fully, right? And like I said, sure, you can patch the initial boundary report in less than one hour, right? And that's pretty impressive. But you actually solve the problems, right? And one of the things that I saw is that there are some companies out there 
Um, and of course, I'm not like shilling any particular company, right? But this is Meta's model, right? And, and that, that when you find a vulnerability in them, say you find a server-side request forgery, they never make the same mistake again. They literally don't, right? You find it once, and the next year you're like, hmm, okay, I'm gonna like relook at this vulnerability that I found, see if they have it anywhere else, it's gone, right? And they have completely fixed this in their entire stack. And there are some companies where you find a cross-site scripting and you know they have a problem in cross-site scripting. And one year later, you're gonna find more cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and you just keep farming them, right? And it's great, I mean, sure, if you're a bug bounty hunter and you're making maybe $500 a pop, right? Sure, that's good for business, right? Um, but again, it just tells you that this is probably not a company that you want to trust your data with, right? Because they find a vulnerability, they're only concerned with patching it, but they're not concerned with why that vulnerability happened, right? And this is an important problem, right? Why does a vulnerability happen? Um, do you just code badly? Um, sure, right? But then does that mean that someone should have built a guardrail, right? Before you committed that code, um, that should have been scared saying, hey, there's something wrong, right? Or maybe is it because you, you know, you just use the wrong tools, right? Your stuff is just vulnerable by default, or maybe you're using like the wrong SQL li library, right? But these are all problems that are solvable, right? And, and there are also problems that I think it's easy to blame on people. Um, one of the things I've observed in this industry is that a lot of beginners um, or starting out, you know, when you first start a security program, you think that um, the problem lies between you know the chair and the keyboard, right? The people, right? And it's easy to blame. You'd be like, hey, why did they click that link? Why did this programmer put in an SQL injection? It's so easy, right? But I think one of the things that you have to think about when you're building both software and security programs is good intentions don't work, right? Um, you know, you have all the best intentions in the world, but humans are always going to be humans. And if you build, make it really hard to, for example, log into a system, you know, you have to go through like MFA and complex passwords um, because it makes it more secure, people are going to find a way around it, right? How many of you have experience where you've gotten a very complex password requirement and so it's, and you have to change it every year? And so all you do is just change one word, right? You say it's like falling author 1234 exclamation mark. And the next day it's falling author 1345, right? So did that control where they force you to go through all those hoops to make your password more secure actually make the system more secure? It did it, right? And that's, I think, the, the beauty of engineering. It's the beauty of software development. It's the beauty of security. Is that your systems don't operate in a vacuum. Humans are interacting with it. And humans are going to adapt for better, for worse, right? And you have to adapt as well. And you have to figure out what's the best way to build a system that makes sense. Uh, a lot of security people build systems and controls and, 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 and I think regulations, compliance rules, with the assumption that everyone does it perfectly, right? But that's not how you build anything. Uh, and if you have built any kind of decently sized piece of software that maybe serves more than 1,000 people, right, you're gonna get complaints, you're gonna get people like clicking the wrong thing, they're gonna cause like all kinds of, of quality control issues for you. And these are things you never anticipate. And that's something that the software industry is really familiar with. But actually the security industry has, I think it's still, I, like, I mean, I like to say that the security industry tends to be about three or four years behind the software engineering industry, right? And we're still rediscovering a lot of the lessons learned there. And we want to bring it forward. And the third thing that I think I saw where I saw organizations that were better, right? That somehow fixed problems better, was that they were secure by default, right? So I'll tell you a story about this vulnerability I found in Facebook, right? Um, and basically, Facebook was using a, uh, a whiteboarding <coughs> library uh, in Messenger, right? Because maybe when you have a Messenger call, I don't know who uses Messenger calls, but maybe some people do, right? You have a video call with someone, you have a little whiteboard where you can you know, draw and put pictures in that. And you're using an open source library built by one of the engin engineers. And, then, and that open source library actually did have a vulnerability. And that was a process with the vulnerability. But um, even though it could have affected, it affected some parts of Facebook, it didn't actually affect that core Facebook app. Because what they had done for this messenger call was that um, this whiteboard actually wasn't shared between the two users. They just took a video screen recording of that whiteboard on your side of the house, and then they used it and flashed it in the video that showed to the other guy. So even if you put the payload, you're only going to ever affect yourself. It wasn't going to hit the other person, right? But to me, that kind of reflected that someone had thought about this. Someone had thought about, hey, sure, we think this whiteboard app 
dynamic app, right? It's safe today. It's an open source thing, right? But it's open source, right? So people could go in any the open source maintainer the next day could just add in some kind of vulnerability in it, and 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 you know then everyone in Messenger is now affected. So they're like, okay, let's just put this little wall, and no matter how bad this whiteboard app is going to be, it's never actually going to break beyond just one user, right? And so you actually bake this in by design. You don't assume that you know we hand tested this entire whiteboard app once, it's going to be secure for the rest of the way. How do you make it secure forever, right? And this is something I've observed in some of the best big tech companies out there. So, why is this important? And why did I, um, why did this inspire me, right? And we often talk about the cost of too little security, right? Companies, it's cost for companies to use to invest in cybersecurity. That's true. Um, and, and I think we kind of avoid that question a lot. But then the question is, what's the cost of too much security, right? And this is something that is very prevalent in high compliance um, industries, including the government where I work, right? Where there's actually a lot of cost invested in security because everyone's really scared, right? Because all of you are going to go on Reddit and like make, you know, complain bulls say, hey, why are you all so insecure? You know, I paid my taxpayers' money, right? And so, you know, the managers actually go back and be like, okay, let's use every single security control out there and throw it to the developers and force them to do it, right? And then developers are going to have to spend time to do credential rotation. They're going to have to spend time to build all these things. There's compliance cost, the cost of checking that people are doing what you think that they should be doing. There is operational cost, right? So think about this. If there is a, uh, if you want to make sure that developers log into the AWS, you know, they go through something called a privileged identity management system, right? So before they even have access to that, uh, they have to go through like some kind of jump holes or kind of, uh, uh, they have to jump through hoops before they even get that credential. Right. So what happens when there's an incident and then everyone's rushing to log in into their AWS account, but because you have this little layer in the way that's slowing everyone down, the whole thing goes down and no one can access the AWS account. Right. There is actually a compliance operational cost to this. There's development cost. Right. So for any of you who has done an internship uh, with a high compliance industry uh, company, right, even the government, right, where you go through all these checks, obviously that slows down your delivery time. And then, of course, the last thing is just monetary cost, right? Um, uh, if you look at the figures for the US, it costs almost $100 billion for the government uh, in cybersecurity, right? They invested that in cybersecurity. And, you know, cybersecurity is one of those things where you just tell, you say, ooh, ooh, you know, like, you tell management, ooh, you know, there's a ghost that will come and destroy your business, you know, if you don't invest in cybersecurity. And then it's somehow, like, their monkey brain turns on, there's a brain, right? And they throw all the money at you, right? And you go home and you're happy, right? But you know, I work for the government, and, and is, it, is it sensible? You know, do you, you I, I didn't feel like this, right? right. I, I felt that, sure, we care about Singaporean security, we care about our data, these are all important things, but we gotta spend our money right, and we gotta do it right. Um, just because we're the government, doesn't mean that we can't do it as well as big tech, or we should try, right? And, and so I, I, after, you know, seeing hundreds of organizations, the way that they deal with security, their yeah, security posture, testing your websites, you know, I felt that we could do better. And that's why I wanted to get into cybersecurity engineering and build something like that in the government. Yeah, so so I think I think that's the funny thing, right? It's, it's almost like uh, there's a story, right? Okay, I, I don't remember it perfectly, it might be completely wrong, right? But, you know, there was a story where um, I think there was an aid organization, right, trying to get people to uh, add iron or some kind of tablet uh, into their water, right, in order to sanitize it, right? And, and a lot of people didn't trust it, right, because it's just a random tablet um, that, um, that they didn't trust, they didn't know what it was. So what they did instead was that they sold this as, hey, this is a talisman, right? And, and this is a talisman that will keep, you know, ghost away or something like that. And, and so people just kept it in their well because that's what they, they trusted, right? Um, and in some ways, a lot of compliance and security like goes that way, right? Where you give them this talisman where if you implement, if only you perfectly implemented all 100 of these, you would have no cybersecurity problems, right? And that's completely not true. Failures happen all the time, and, and these are security failures, right? How do you adapt to them is far more important than trying to avoid this ghost that is hanging over everyone's shoulder. So what do we build then? How do we build our way to security, right? Instead of going around whipping everyone and being like, hey, you never change your password. 
that because of you, you know, we're going to get hacked, right? That's not true. Right? Um, how do you build something? How do you build for security? So, one of the books I think that's pretty good out there uh, that came out recently, and I say this because you know security is always four years behind, right? Uh, software engineering. So now they start talking about security chaos engineering, even though chaos engineering has been a thing for a few years now, right? And, and one of the principles out there that, uh, that the author said, Kelly Shortridge, right, is that security, the best kind of security, is invisible. You don't even know that someone's trying to secure you, right? It's already been removed. So, so, so how do you build something like that, right? So let's do a little exercise right now. Okay, you are in a concrete building, right? And maybe in a concrete building, there is a room where they store barrels of gunpowder or nuclear waste, right? And if you don't, are not careful, if you, you know, push over one of these, it's going to explode, and then you know you don't have to worry about getting your next job anymore, right? So, how are you going to make sure you're safe? Do you have any ideas? Why? What? What will you do? Say you are like I don't know, administrator of concrete building. There's a barrel for gunpowder. Yeah, what will you do? There's, the, there's like people that actually can manufacture it. Can you give me the fire safety? Okay, so fire safety. So 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 rules, right? Uh, 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 how, how, how you yeah, kind of... Like no smoking at all. Right, no smoking at all, right? So you tell people, hey, don't smoke. Because there's literally like gunpowder, right? I don't know how many of you guys have served in the ammunition, but you know, there are a lot of rules for that. Okay, any other ideas? How would you make sure that this room doesn't explode on you? Yeah, keeping quiet is not gonna. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so so you you do an engineering solution. That's great, right? You remove all the oxygen. So as long as this pump keeps working and removing oxygen, twenty four seven, right? You have a generator, maybe you have a backup. You must keep working because then you are confirmed it will not explode. That's that's pretty good. Idea. Okay, yeah. Put a guard outside, right? Make sure no one enters it so that they can't accidentally trip over it. Remove okay, the, sorry? Remove the gunpowder. Remove the gunpowder. <laughs> wow, okay, great. Come, you get a job. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so there are many ideas, right? The first is, yeah, let's just remove the barrel, right? Why, why are we giving a barrel of gunpowder in a where where you know students are doing all kinds of things, right? Another thing is, yes, you can lock the room behind blast doors, right? Technically, if you lock it and no one figures out the lock and key lock, they'll never get it, you'll never explode. And even if it explodes, then everyone's protected, right? You can tell people to avoid rule. Behavioral change, right? Obvious, but you know, some people will still try their luck, right? Or you can even require armor, right? Hey, if you want to enter this room, you must wear this bomb-proof suit to enter the room. Okay, so which control would you implement first? Which control? I think most of us would say maybe let's just remove it, right? So we don't have to spend the rest of our lives worrying about this room that's inside the concrete building. Would it make sense to build the concrete? Would it make sense to be like the, 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 stack, the place where they make the chemical, they should put it there? Yeah, exactly. Move it, right? Yeah. They know what to do with that. Yeah. So, so let's think about... Oh, I already spoiled it. Okay. So, so let's think about this problem, right? The passwords, right? So all of you maybe have built a web app in the past and have used passwords, right? And, and you think about actually how would you then avoid being brute force, right? Because that is a legit issue. Some people do brute force passwords. Or they hack huge databases of other people's passwords and reuse those passwords. And so there are many solutions, right? You can use a password versus login. So just use like login in Google, right? You can add password sorting and hashing. Um, that's one way. You can add rate limits. You can add two-factor authentication. But actually, if you just wanted to solve this problem, forget about it and don't worry about it and focus on building your cool new app that will make millions of dollars for you, you just use um, passwordless, right? And that's why you see so many companies out there just have login in Google or login in GitHub, right? Because it just solves the problem for you. So, so this is something called the hierarchy of controls, right? It's something that's done in engineering, real engineering, right? Aeronautical engineering, uh, construction, right? And, and this is actual uh, safety and risk guidelines, right? I would first eliminate the problem by just removing it, remove the hazard, right? Then you don't have to worry about it. But if you really can't remove it, then why don't you substitute, substitute it, right? Remove uh, the air, right? Uh, the oxygen, right? Engineering controls, right? Have you have something pumping uh, some of these challenges away? Administrative controls, tell people to get out of the room, stay away from it, right? And PPE, lah, so just go in a piece of armor and, and make sure you do it. Or you have two-factor authentication, maybe. So 
there is a best option, right? There are best options for every scenario. You can do all four of their controls. You can spend all your money implementing password changing, uh, password hashing, salting, and, and all that. But there is better options out there. And the goal is to then release, you know, maybe I'm, I'm stealing from Zuria, but he has a really good blog post, so you should check out his, his blog post um, about it. But the challenge is, how do you make the best option, the cheapest and the easiest one, right? And then you don't have to think about it anymore. So let's think about one of these problems, right? Some of you have probably seen that, uh, Mr. NCS, you know, got fired one day, still angry, still had his IM user credentials, they forgot to remove it, right? And log in and delete it. I don't know, like 30,000 servers or something, right? That's a problem, right? That's, that's pretty bad. You don't want that to happen to your government, right? But it's actually really hard, okay? And, and I know all of you will be like, oh, you know, the government, we should do it well. You, you look at your own AWS account and, and tell me how many users are there. Okay? I, think, I think you have a few still left over. Look at your GitHub SSH PATs. I think you still have a lot, right? So within the organization, in the government, how would we solve it, right? We could force everyone, hey, every 90 days, you must rotate your IAM credentials, right? And we will check it and we will yell at you if you don't, right? Um, and, and we could, right? Um, or we can just make everyone to never use IAM user credentials, just use short-lived credentials. AWS supports stuff like SSO, uh, they support stuff like uh, OIDC, right? And these are ways that even if you're using AWS services and need authentication, it's all short-lived, right? So there's no chance of anything being stolen. You remove the possibility. The problem is, uh, and, and you know, AWS actually does do this nowadays. Like if you try to like create a credential, I, they'll be like, hey, why are you using it? Why do you need a credential? And you select any of these options, they'll be like, you're making a bad decision. Don't do it, bro. Like, please don't do it. <laughs> uh, they, they actually have this menu where they'll be like, yo, it's a bad decision. But at that point, right, you just want to authenticate your app. And why should you spend all that time reading their documentation on how to implement this awesome solution that AWS did? Because it's, I just want to get online. I want to deploy my app right now. Right, I'm just going to copy and paste this credential, and I think it should be safe, and I'll forget about it. I'll remember to rotate it, like, and you never, you never do, right? And that's how you get NCS uh, deletions. So, so I, I think one of the things that we are building here is that we're trying to make the good option, which is actually very hard, easy, right? And one of the ways that we're doing it is using infrastructure as code, right? Um, so, for example, for GitHub OIDC, where you have a GitHub CI/CD pipeline that is deploying to AWS. Yeah, you can use AWS secrets, but actually you should be using OIDC. Um, but it's actually pretty hard to set up, right? Um, and, and so some of what our team has done um, previously is to basically just convert this into infrastructure as code. And if they just copy it, any developer just copy and paste this into their infrastructure stack, it's done for them right away. They just need to tell them what my repo is and you know uh, what my AWS account is. And it's done for them, right? So now for that developer, when they are faced with that choice and be like, yo, I want to deploy from my action to AWS. Do I just create this or do I just copy and paste this, right? And it'll be done for me automatically. And it's become a lot easier. We've seen some better adoption of GitHub for IDC this way. Second problem, supply chain issues, right? So there's a huge backdoor. Every so often, every six months, there is a vulnerability in a dependency that we really care about, right? There's a backdoor or there's a huge problem like, uh, I think, uh, the logging one in Java for a while, right? Those were all pretty big. And what happens when we have those issues, right? We will be like, we ping every single developer like, yo, please, please look into your AWS account and let us know if you have installed this dependency <coughs> anywhere, right? And how many people are going to look at your site message? How many people are going to respond to it? How many people are going to waste their time spending a whole day to shake down your AWS account to figure out if they've installed it? Or you could just build something that already does this for you. So you don't even have to ping anyone. It's already being sent to you, right? You already know what they've installed. And this is pretty simple, right? Uh, in terms of architecture, um, deploying is a lot harder, and we can talk about that. Um, but you can just do something where developers can just up this solution once. You know, you can even make it a single click operation, and it's in their operation, or you build it into a default in your AWS call. And they don't actually ever know it exists anymore, right? It just exists. And when there is the next exit utils, when there is the next um, uh, you know, zero day in a, a very important library that everyone has installed, they don't even get a ping from us, right? Because we know who is affected, and only those who are affected need to be worried about it, right? And we no longer have that problem anymore. And it becomes a lot faster. 
So I think I've taken up a lot of time already, um, and I know there's one more talk after me. Um, but I think this is one of the problems that we face as security engineers today, right? How do you solve security problems? And a lot of the ways that you see out there today is that there's a lot of flashy um, thoughts about, okay, we can hack our way to security, right? We can hack so well that, of course, you must be secure. And that's not the truth. You will see a lot of, um, you'll see a lot of cybersecurity you know, companies, you know, the way that they market is that they find zero days and then they make a flashy blog post about it. Right? And they be like, okay, we are capable of finding zero days. So buy our tool that will prevent you from being affected by these zero days. But that isn't actually true because they just have really good volume <coughs> researchers, but they don't necessarily have a very bond, a good tool. Similarly for uh, you know, any agency or, or, or organization right, that claims to be able to protect your systems. So yeah, I'm looking for people. Uh, if you're interested in building security, engineering, and you're combining both of those interests, let me know. I have a book up. <laughs> Feel free to scan. Let me know and talk to me uh, afterwards as well. Um, and, and you know, if you have any questions as well about security, uh, life, um, hacking, anything in general, let me know. Um, and really, uh, thanks for your time today. Cool. CrowdStrike in their computers plan for CrowdStrike ever crashing their yeah, systems. Let's, right? let's say your, your Google account gets compromised because someone figured out that someone got your, your access to your Google account already. Right, yeah. So, so how, how do you plan for that centralization to, to happen, right? And, and I'll, tell you, I'll tell you this, right? There is, there is, it's true, right? Um, yeah, you make the value of one thing become a lot more, more dangerous. It becomes more of a central point of failure. But it's also a lot easier to secure one thing than 10 things, right? And any security engineering program, I think, would then have to make that choice, right? Do you choose reliability? Do you choose security? Do you choose fail safes? And do you choose you know, um, the ability to quickly change or recover uh, as compared to one, right? And I think most people, over time, there is some centralization. We see it in the industry as well, right? Um, and, and I think that wins out because of the balance between cost and security. So it's basically saying that it's easier to protect like one central resource. Yeah, so I'm, I'm careful with that because a lot of people use the centralization as a way to like force everyone to use the same tool, right? That they conveniently built as well. Um, and, and so I, I think it really depends on the problem as well. Is it password? Is it you know uh, uh, using your 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 boundary management software, right? Is it necessary to use the same tool? And if you see it in big tech firms, actually, it's actually quite common for uh, many services that solve the same problem. Um, it just depends on your company. Do you want the government to have five different uh, coupon apps? I don't know. Tell me. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the coming up box apps. Yeah. The issue is is more. I see more of it as a software based issue. Yeah. As if they didn't even bother to do testing. Yeah. So people were saying that if they tested, then they would have. Yeah. Or, or if they staged, then they would have down. Yeah. So, so your point was that the cross strike problem wasn't really a security problem, it was a software quality problem, right? And I, I agree with that totally, right? And, and so the question is then why have we allowed the security industry to get away with bad engineering? 
right? Um, and why we, you know, why do we allow antiviruses to take up so much capacity, so much cost, right? Um, and it shouldn't be, right? So we do need better engineers in the security space. People know what security problems are, but are also able to build a solution. That's a great question, right? And, and so, so the thing about security engineering is that it shares a lot with platform engineering, right? And if you sort of work in you know, some of the big tech firms, right? A lot of the engineers don't actually do a, the full stack, right? There's, a, there's one team that does all the Q, Kubernetes clusters. There's another team that does the databases, right? But there's also the argument made that actually, you know, do we really need to like have all these services? Because actually an engineer, it's not that hard to set up a Postgres container, right? Just do it and, and get your job done, right? Um, again, I, I hate to say it, but it, you know, it's one of those questions that every organization has to solve for themselves, right? Um, in order to serve one, you know, and, and this is a quote, uh, in order to serve 10,000 cubes, cubes, right? Cube, cube clusters, right? You don't need, technically you don't need 10,000 Kubernetes experts, right? You actually do need one. And so it's really important to have that in mind because I think one of the challenges with security, similar to platform engineering, is that if you want to keep a job, if I want to keep my job, right, there's a huge temptation to keep introducing security problems and not solve the actual problem. There's a huge temptation to be like, hey, actually, you know, sure, we have solved access control, but have we solved, I don't know, whether people are setting, you know, uh, whether people are setting the right password, you know, uh, every day, right? Maybe that's not a problem that needs to be solved, right? And, and so I think the problem with security is that a lot of times people scare management being like, oh, we'll get hacked, you know, if doomsday, you know, your name will be in papers, you go to jail and all that stuff. Um, and so that forces management to do everything. But I believe security problems are finite, right? I think it's a myth in cybersecurity that you cannot solve security. You can solve for security. You, it's a finite space in the, in the long run. Uh, and, and having that change of mindset will then allow that your security engineering program makes sense. Just a quick question. Do you guys actually use Codigy in production? This is like, yo, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I guess it's curious. Um, okay, so in OGP, you actually our stack is, depends on the team, right? Some teams, uh, they, teams are free to choose their stack. Um, so some teams are obviously use CDK. Uh, I think a while back, some used Terraform, some used Volumi. Yeah. Any any thoughts about Volumi? No, no, no I'm, just, I'm just curious because like Volumi is like the, it's like, Kind of like I would imagine like the adoption for like Terraform would be more right. Would it be like just more mm. kind of newer parties? I don't use Terraform. Um, not so much. I actually dabble around with it. So I was like kind of yeah, curious yeah. whether you guys use it. Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, Terraform sucks, man. Yeah. So <laughs> <Okay>. uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I think CDK is way, way better. Volumi is cool because you know it, it allows you to be imperative and decorative at the same time. Yeah, but you know you got organization and you got bureaucracy and stuff, and then you can't use. It. Um, yeah, but we don't have that OGP, right? Yeah. So you, you can choose the tool that makes sense. And you know, I had some very opinionated uh, interns before. Uh, so he's quite opinionated, but I have another intern uh, who's flying today, uh, but um, very opinionated and has changed my stack multiple times, right? So I think whatever makes sense, right? Uh, I'm kind of resigned to it because I think, you know, sometimes we just like the latest toy and, and want to deploy it, right? Sometimes it's not super maintainable. but. In the end, it's not super complex stuff that we're up We're not dealing with like tens of millions of users, right? It's just a matter of choice, right? Yeah, and if you have fun building, then you should have fun building, right? <coughs> Any questions? Pizza? <laughs> nice. Okay. All good? Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, you can feel free to just come up to me later and, and, and have a chat. Yeah. Oh, was that supposed to talk for like longer? No, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, let's thank Eugene for his awesome talk. <laughs> and, yeah, so uh, we'll be taking a short break now. Feel free to go over and have some of the pizza. Uh, it's in the corner there. And then we'll return in about 10 minutes. So we'll have our next talk. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>